Welcome to Auto Chatter. Today's episode is about GM's J-Body cars. These successful front-wheel drive subcompacts were sold for a long time and was a world car, sort of, as other parts of the planet had their own versions too. So let's explore a bit deeper about these cars. As always, facts, opinion, and speculation will be given. Please give a like if you enjoyed it and consider subscribing if you haven't yet. Now let's get started. The 1970s was certainly a transition decade when it came to cars. The early part of the decade was still popular for muscle cars, huge sedans, and personal luxury coupes. Two oil crises later in a single decade helped lead to a lot of cars with big engines that had their horsepower ratings choked by emissions, and there was a definite trend towards downsizing as cars that got 10 miles to the gallon was going out of style faster than lava lamps and pet rocks. GM actually did a good job in the disco era, downsizing their fleet, and their gaze didn't go unnoticed on the cars that sold that were already small. They were already selling rear-wheel drive T-platform cars by the mid-70s here and abroad, and one well-known in the U.S. was the Chevette. GM was also selling rear-wheel drive H-body cars in North America, starting with the Vega, and eventually the Monza, Astri, Sunbird, Skyhawk, and Starfire join in, all sharing the same basic platform. Meanwhile, in other parts of the world, GM brands they owned outright or had a sizable stake in had T-platform cars and Opel created a slightly longer version of it called a U-body. But by 1976 or so, a plan was in place to consolidate all of these into a more common front-wheel drive platform in the near future. This is when the J-body started development. As far as the US, the J-body was originally slated to only spawn off two cars, a Chevrolet and a Pontiac version. These compact vehicles would be slotted in between the T-Platform Chevette and later Pontiac T-1000, and the upcoming X-Cars like the Citation and Phoenix. Buick and Oldsmobile got on board to develop their own J-Bodies a little bit later, and I'm sure the second gas crunch in 1979 and weaker economy made it sound like an even better idea for them. There was another J-Body Model 2 that was greenlit literally at the 11th hour before the deadline. That would be the Cadillac Cimarron, and I've done a video on it some time back if you're interested. I'm not going to go into super detail, but for other markets you had several J-Body cars launching in the early 80s too. These include the Chevy Monza, which was a South American model, Holden Camira Down Under, Isuzu Aska, Opel Esconda C, and Vauxhall Cavalier. They didn't necessarily look like what we got in the US or even shared powertrains, but they were all J-bodies. Anyway, for the 82 model year in North America, we get five badge-engineered beauties to choose from. Chevy replaced the Monza with the all-new Cavalier. Pontiac had the J2000, and the previous car was a Monza clone called the Sunbird. Oldsmobile replaced its previous Monza lookalike, the Starfire, with the Firenza, which is a name I've never really been fond of. Buick seemed to be the only one happy with the previous name they had in this class, so kept Skyhawk for their new front-wheel drive compact. Pontiac would eventually change their mind later too in that regard, but we'll get to that. The final J-body for 82 would be the infamous Cimarron by Cadillac, and unlike the others, wasn't a direct replacement for anything else in their lineup. Asking what's under the hood for 1982 and all five models was easy, as the short answer was not much. For their first year, they all had a carbureted 1.8 liter 4 with 88 horsepower. A 4-speed manual was standard, or you could opt for a 3-speed automatic if you were really in no hurry. There was body style differences depending on which GM store you were at though. The Cavalier and J2000 had four different ones at launch. You could get a two-door coupe, three-door hatch, four-door sedan, or a station wagon. Oldsmobile initially offered the three-door hatch or four-door sedan, and Buick had two-door coupes or a four-door sedan. Cadillac only offered the four-door. All of these cars were very similar, sharing basically all their sheet metal, if it had the same body style as another brand. Front and rear differences was about the only thing unique, and things like wheels or hubcap styles. Prices varied wildly as base Cavalier with two doors, seats, and an engine 
started at $6,648, or about $21,400 today. A Pontiac J2000 was about $500 more, so $22,800 now. Oldsmobile's Fire Enza hatchback started around $7,800 or $25,000 today. The Pontiac and Chevy versions of this three-door were only a couple hundred bucks less to start. The base Buick Skyhawk Coupe started around $7,200 or $23 grand a day. That leaves the Cadillac starting around $12,600 or 40500 in 2024. The sedan versions of all the others started under $8,000. So that's about 15 grand less in today's dollars to the Cimarron. Sure, the Caddy had things like AC, a radio, and leather standard, but you still had to pay extra for stuff like power windows and locks. Sales-wise, the J-Bodies were strong sellers overall, but some sold a lot better than others. Chevy uh, moved about 195,000 Cavaliers its first year, and Pontiac did almost 119,000. Oldsmobile was only about 30,000 though, and Buick almost hit 48. Cadillac was last in sales at around $26,000, which actually wasn't bad considering how expensive they were. For 1983, all the North American J-Bodies got a new engine. Well, it's actually a slightly larger version of last year's, being a 2.0-liter now, but it has throttle body fuel injection too. Horsepower isn't really better, but it's a welcome improvement from last year. GM also had a uh, Opel-designed 1.8 liter on the Pontiac, Oldsmobile, and Buick versions available too that was imported from Brazil. Chevy offers a new convertible Cavalier now which is significant as it's the first drop top Chevy that they've offered since the mid 70s. Convertibles in the 70s were threatened with extinction due to rollover safety concerns so the domestic car makers dropped them as options for years. They were never banned, but by the late 70s there was very few convertibles to choose from, and it would likely be something from Europe if you bought one. The Cavalier convertible was a conversion made by ASC. I've mentioned them more than a few times now as they made a lot of convertible factory cars for several manufacturers. It wasn't cheap, starting at $11,360 or $35,400 today and you could almost buy two base Cavaliers for that then. Pontiac started offering an optional 5-speed manual, and the Cadillac was standard with it. Buick's top trim T-Type Coupe came with the 5-speed too. Pontiac also drops the J in its name, and it's now called just a 2000. Might seem a little weird, but its bigger brother then was the 6000, and the Chevette clone was a 1000. Oldsmobile and Buick started offering a wagon version this model year too. Oldsmobile also now has a sporty model only in the three-door hatch called a GT with special paint, trim, wheels, and suspension upgrades. 83 sales grew even more for Cavalier now, selling over 218,000 and that includes about a thousand convertibles. Pontiac eased back a bit to 78,000 and Buick was around 63. Oldsmobile rose some to 40700 or so, and Cadillac falls to just over 19000 For 1984, Cavalier gets a new grille and four headlights instead of two. Chevy also offered their sportier Type 10 package on coupes, convertibles, and hatchbacks. This trim was eventually replaced by RS models later. Pontiac is still working out what to call their car, so for 1984, it's a 2000 Sunbird, literally taking last year's name and adding the one of the car this replaced to it. That's not all the changes for Pontiac this year though. The front end was restyled a bit, and a convertible version was an option now like the Cavalier had. Pontiac also had a Turbo now too, that was a boosted version of the Opel Design 1.8 liter. It had 150 horsepower. Considering a heavier Mustang GT with a V8 then had 175, it was kind of a big deal. The Turbo Sunbird could be had in a coupe, four-door sedan, or the three-door hatch. Buick also offered this engine in their T-Type trim. All the Turbo models were four-speed manual only, and the other divisions would have to wait until 1985 for any optional horsepower improvements. 84 was a huge year for Cavalier, as they sold over 462,000 of them. Pontiac, I'm sure, was pleased beating the 169,000 mark, and Buick wasn't too far behind at 145k. 
Oldsmobile doubles 83 numbers with over 82,000 selling, and Cadillac doesn't quite hit 22,000. For 1985, Chevy offers a 130 horse 2.8 liter V6 as an option with the coupe. This is basically the same engine the Celebrity and the other A bodies had available. The Oldsmobile GT hatch had this V6 optionally, as did the Cadillac Cimarron now. Pontiac and Buick uh, stuck with the optional four cylinder turbo. Cadillac uh, took their first step to making the Cimarron look less like a Cavalier on the outside for 85. Pontiac finally decides to just call their car a Sunbird, it drops the 2000 part for good. The year was a little less stellar for Cavalier, but still almost hit 384,000. Pontiac dipped a bit too, just shy of 112k. Buick falls to around 82,500, and Oldsmobile drops back down near its 83 numbers to around 44,000. Cadillac hovers around 20,000 with the Cimarron. Cavalier gets a new sporty trim model for 1986 called a Z24. These were available in the two-door coupe or hatch. They had a sportier exterior features like ground effects, a little fancier front end, alloy wheels, and digital gauges. The 2.8 liter V6 was standard with them too. The previous sport package was called a Type 10. This was renamed RS and it remains an option. The convertible now has the V6 available too. Not to be outdone, Pontiac ups its sporty game too this year. A new GT model is now here and it's available in almost every body style Sunbird had but the wagon. They had a 150 horsepower turbocharged engine, fender flares, the always crowd pleasing pop up headlights and more. Even the convertible offered a GT version now alongside the regular SE one. Buick Skyhawks this year get some smoother styling tweaks up front and fancier trims like the T-Type and Limited models get pop up headlights too. Even the wagons, which looks weird to me. It's like two different cars were cut in half and welded together. Anyway, Oldsmobile's GT hatch is its own model this year, as it was an option for the hatch before, and about a thousand were made. Cadillac Cimarron got wraparound rear taillights, and you had an optional Bose stereo available. It was also the last year for them in Canada, which is often an early sign your car isn't doing well. A more recent example of this is the Nissan Titan, as it's already been dropped there for a few years. Cavalier sales for 86 rebound nicely to uh, over 432,000. Pontiac also improves, topping 135k. Buick has a good showing, breaking the 90,000 barrier, and Oldsmobile does slightly better than last year at around 46,700. Cadillac actually has a decent year with sales not too far off of uh, 25,000. That's only about 1,500 less than its best selling year in 1982. 1987 marks the final year for the first gen Cavaliers, and the whole lineup pretty much carries over from last year, besides the V6 Z24 models having a 5 speed. The 2 liter base engine for all these J cars is revised and they gain 5 horsepower which puts them around 90. The Pontiac, Oldsmobile, and Buick Opel based optional 4s are now 2 liters as well and they're rated at 96 horsepower. The turbo engines were also 2 liters now and the Sunbird and Buick T-Type turbo models now have 165 horsepower. The Pontiac Grand Am got this engine available too. This would also be the last year for this gen Sunbird. Oldsmobile's Fire Enza GT has the 2.8 liter V6 with a 5 speed now like the Cavalier Z24. This is the last year for Oldsmobile's hatchback. The Cimarron was the first J body to get composite headlights and now the V6 was standard. Sales in 87 for this gen Cavalier finishes well at over 346,000. Pontiac dips to just over 87k. Buick drops to its lowest number this gen yet at just under 47,000, and Oldsmobile has its worst year too, not quite hitting 26,000. Cadillac isn't selling 15,000 Cimarrons now, and the price rose about 1,500 bucks from 1986. A lot of that was probably due to the now standard V6. 1988 marks the final year for the two slowest selling J bodies. The Oldsmobile Fire Enza loses its V6 option, 
and three-door hatch model as I mentioned earlier. They did get composite headlights and new rear taillights, making them resemble the larger Cutlass Sierra. Final year sales for Fire Enza was around 12200 and it was basically dropped due to poor sales. The slightly larger end-body Cutlass Calais would now assume the entry-level spot at Oldsmobile. The infamous Cadillac Cimarron is on its last year too. Cadillac uh, caught a lot of flack even producing this car, but did try to make it less cavalier and more its own thing throughout the years. Ultimately though, its final year only sold about 8,600 units, and a combination of slow sales and resources that were deemed better spent on other models killed it off. No direct replacement was made, but Cadillac did offer another entry-level caddy based off an economy car about 10 years later that I discussed in my Opal video. Buick Skyhawk was also leaving us soon, but did go another model year past its Oldsmobile and Cadillac cousins. The turbo models were gone for 1988, leaving just the regular four-cylinders, and the hatchback versions were history too. About 29,000 sell in 1988. By 89, only the GM 2.0-liter was an option, and this is the last Buick with a manual transmission available, until the 2011 Buick Regal launches, which was a rebadged Opal. Sales finished for the Skyhawk at around 23,300 sold. As for the Cavalier and Sunbird, they were the original two planned for the US and turned out to be the best selling of all North American J-Bodies. I plan on a future episode continuing their tale, as J-Bodies were a thing until the 21st century, including a Toyota one. But for now, this will conclude the first gen of J-Bodies in North America, and I do hope you enjoyed it. Give a like if so, and please consider subscribing if you haven't yet. Thank you, as always, to current subscribers, and, the, and I really do appreciate the many wonderful comments and discussions. Bye for now, and until next time, chatter out.